again, just a heaven is taking up your records and you can go to heaven as you like. My name is Eustace. I born in Paget Farm, Beckway. My great grandfather, he was a whaler, that whale on the Yankee whaling ship. My grandfather also whale on the Yankee whaling ship. Then my father, he was a whaler. So I always tell myself, when I grow up, I want to be a whaler also. I met Eustace some 20 years ago on the tiny island of Bekwe in the Southeast Caribbean. He was a teenager hoping to realize his childhood ambition and find a position on the whaling crew with this man, Chief Harpooner, at Neil Alaber. When I harpoon a whale, from the time I harpoon a whale, I turn like a lion. I don't want nobody to talk to me. I mean that as a fighter, the whale can kill me any time, so I don't study what I have to die or not. I mean I must kill the whale. And I, I t telling them to do this in your boat and do that, and I also want to be, have the boat right up to the whale. And I feel that nobody mustn't tell me nothing, don't tell me I can't do this, don't tell me I can't do that. I mean it, it a harpoon and I must kill it. Whaling here started in the mid-1800s, when the Yankee whalers enlisted and trained the talented seamen of Beckway. One of them bought two boats from the Yankee whalers and started a fishery here in Friendship Bay. To the consternation of many, Atneal and Eustace, along with a dozen or so other resolute men, plied the 19th century trade of their forefathers into the 21st century. In the last 25 years, the Beckway whalers have landed on average one humpback whale per year. To the delight of the whalers' families and friends hungry for sustenance, the drama of the chase at sea unfolds right in front of them. And the whalers, struggling to maintain a unique identity, hear their neighbors cheering them on. The whalers maintain a deep reverence for nature, as well as a direct connection to their survival. A connection that we, in the modern world, sometimes forget. We do have with us, as well, members of the Board of Trustees of the National Trust, former Chair Mrs. Louise Mitchell-Joseph. Students, again. We also have Trustee Doris Charles, who just gave us the invocation. We do have a number of members of staff. Where are the staff members? Just wave your hand wherever you are standing. Okay, we've seen one. We have a number of persons from the public who would have joined us. And very importantly, we have two groups of persons, the media, and I would leave the best for last, our students who are from that community where whaling has been part of their heritage. You're not here by accident. You have been carefully and deliberately selected and invited because if you look, at, if you look closely at me, you'll see the gray hairs. So you know I'm moving on. I'm, I don't think some of us on this side got to that stage yet, but we're a little more mature on this side. The point in all of that, is that you are going to be the ambassadors. We can't do it alone. The National Trust is not a group of people who walk and live in around Kingston. The National Trust means us, and it means you. And because you are underground, you are the key people for two reasons. You have youth on your side, 
and you need to take the baton from us. The second reason is that you have to go and become our crusaders. You have to go. You know, when you're having crusades in the community, you have to go and knock on the doors and spread the good gospel. That is why you are here. We are entrusting this very important mission into your care. So we are very pleased, and I was a little anxious a while ago when I didn't see you, that you are here, and we are looking forward to, to what you will do once you have completed your mission this morning. Now, <coughs> to present to you the information on the whaling industry, um, the pros and the cons, the, what we know, what we still need to know, is Professor Feelings, and I'm going to ask another trustee to just, just briefly tell us why he is such an important person. We didn't choose anybody, he didn't choose me, he didn't choose me. Why he is such an important person in this mix. So I'm going to invite trustee Louise Mitchell Joseph to just share with us briefly. Dr. Earl Kirby was our local archeologist and he is the first person that I know of in St. Vincent who publicly came out and said that whales should be captured on our cameras and not with harpoons. And from the days of Doc Kirby, it's been the position of the National Trust that we do not support the whaling industry. And what, we, what the National Trust has been doing over the years is to try to find alternative livelihoods other than whaling. And in doing so, we have enlisted the support of Fondacion Sethus, which is an organization from Argentina, represented by Carolina Cassani. And what she's been doing over the years is talking to the whalers about the advantages of moving away from whaling towards whale watching. We now have two gentlemen from Barley, Mr. Lennox Stevens and Mr. Kirk Grant, who have shifted towards whale watching. And with her assistance, they were able to go down to Argentina and actually experience whale watching firsthand. We are now at the next stage where we are, we are looking at not only the advantages in terms of the economic advantages of choosing whale watching rather than whaling, but we're at the point where it's time for us to discuss what are the health um, risks or benefits of actually consuming whale meat, because that's another side of the story. So as we get to this point, I would like to thank um, Adam Gravel of Salvage Blue, who was instrumental in bringing uh, Professor Fielding here to speak to us today. Professor Russell Fielding, he is currently a lecturer at the University of the West Indies in environmental studies. And, but in addition to that, he's not just a, uh, academic, but he has actually worked on the ground in Barley for many years, and that is where he was able to obtain a lot of the information that he's going to be presenting to you today. I just want to take a moment to recognize the presence of Mr. Lennox Stevens, who is um, one of our former whalers from Barley, who has now switched to whale watching. So, Professor Fielding has. Um, We're, we're very fortunate that he has actually been on the ground and he's studied the whales that have been killed in Barley over the years and he's studied the mercury content and the, you know, so he has done very scientific analysis as to, you know, what we would be consuming. Um, he most recently has published um, this book, The Wake of the Whale, which talks about um, the mercury content, not just in whales in St. Vincent, but in other communities around the world where whaling takes place. Um, these books are on sale for $100, and he's going to make a contribution for each one that is sold um, of $25 to the National Trust. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Professor Fielding to come and give the presentation to you this morning. Thank you so much, Louise, and thank you to all of you who are here today, and especially to those students who came all the way from Barley for this morning's event. I very much appreciate seeing you all here. <clears throat> it's March in the Caribbean. Inhabitants of cold northern regions of the globe, North America and Europe, 
are starting to make seasonable, seasonal migrations to this part of the world because of the warmth, because of the sunshine, because of the good food. Some of them come alone. Others come in large groups. Some come with their young. Others come to find new mates. I'm not speaking of tourists. I'm speaking, of course, of humpback whales. Every year, humpback whales that spend the summertime feeding in the cold North Atlantic Ocean travel to the Caribbean not to feed, but to raise their young and to find mates to reproduce with and create new young. During this time, some of these whales are hunted by inhabitants of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This has been happening for many years. Other species of whale, such as blackfish and smaller dolphins, don't make these seasonal migrations. They live year-round here in the Caribbean, and they're also hunted as well. There's a long history of whaling of both styles, for humpback whales and for the smaller cetaceans like blackfish and porpoise, that goes back many years. But it doesn't go all the way back. Early records of the indigenous inhabitants of the Caribbean and archaeological data that we have found through excavation of their settlement sites show that food from the sea has always been a major part of the diet here in the Caribbean. People that lived here in St. Vincent fed themselves and their families from the sea going back to their first arrival in these islands. But so far we have no evidence that they ever used whales or any other marine mammals as part of their food source, with one exception. There have been bones of whales found occasionally that show evidence that they were used after the whales had washed up naturally dead on the shore. To go back to the earliest history of whaling in the Caribbean, we don't go to the indigenous inhabitants nor even to the first European arrivals, nor to the Africans that were brought by force by those European arrivals. We go later than that. In the 1800s, American whalers began passing through the Caribbean en route to other parts of the world where whales were known to be found. But, just as Herman Melville pointed out in Moby Dick, the whalers were always looking for whales. They may have been heading to the Pacific Ocean, or they may have been heading to the Indian Ocean around the Cape of Good Hope, but they were looking for whales during their entire voyage. At some point, someone from an American whaling ship began to notice that there were whales right here in the Caribbean. They didn't have to travel so far, use up so many resources to get halfway around the globe if they wanted to find whales. They could find them right here, just a short voyage from their home ports in New England and in the northeastern United States more generally. So they started whaling in the Caribbean. For several decades, whaling boats, whaling ships from ports in New England would make seasonal trips to the Caribbean to coincide with the migration of the humpback whale. They brought crews from America. American whalers working on board American ships, taking whales here, boiling them down mostly for oil, putting that oil into barrels and bringing it back to New England, to ports like Nantucket, Mystic, New Bedford, Boston, Providence, to sell the oil there for a profit. After a while though, these captains and these boat owners began to realize that they were spending too much money on crew salaries, too much money in their way of thinking about it. And just like happens now, they started for looking for a labor force that wouldn't cost so much. They started looking for laborers that could work aboard their ships, but wouldn't require such large expenditures in salary. They found them right here in the Caribbean. Men, and it was exclusively men, who had been trained in fishing, who were already productive fishermen, were hired aboard these American whaling ships and taught the skills of the whaler. They would go around for a season, usually staying here in the Caribbean, occasionally traveling across the ocean with these whale ships as they went further afield, and they would help them hunt for whales. 
the main species that they were going for were these two, the sperm whale and the humpback whale. These are both large whales. I don't know if you've ever seen one out in the wild. I know that Mr. Lennox here has. They're large animals. In order to train the men how to catch these whales, they were given smaller targets for practice. And that's where the blackfish comes in. The apprentices, the, the novices that were brought on board these whaling boats, taught how to hunt humpback whales and sperm whales, were given harpoons and told to go after blackfish, scientifically known as short fin pilot whale or Globocephala macarancus, as target practice and as a way to learn the skills of the whaler. This went on for many years, and it occurred in many islands around the Caribbean. This is a chart from a paper written by other researchers that shows how many whale ships came into the port at various Caribbean islands. And you see that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is not even close to the most popular port for these American whale ships. And yet, if you look around the Caribbean today, St. Vincent and the Grenadines are the capital of Caribbean whaling. Yes, it occurs occasionally on some other islands. St. Lucia occasionally, Dominica until recently. Grenada, perhaps a little. I've heard of some in Trinidad. Where I live in Barbados, it has now stopped, but it used to happen there a lot. But this isn't a result of St. Vincent and the Grenadines being the most popular port for these American whalers. That title goes to Barbados, clearly. So why? has St. Vincent retained this tradition of whaling long after the American whalers have stopped coming here. It all goes back to this man on the left. Old Bill Wallace is a native of Bequay, was a native of Bequay. He was one of these men that was hired on board the American whaling ships. And he spent a lot more time on board than others did. His whaling ship that he happened to sign on board did whale throughout the Caribbean, but it also went up the east coast of North America. He got off the boat in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He married the daughter of the captain and brought her back to Beckway, and they started a family there together. He was in. He was very much entrenched in the life of the whaler. Eventually, North American whaling in this part of the world stopped. The reason it stopped is because they had caught too many whales too quickly and it was no longer economically profitable for them to put in the capital investments to make such large voyages from their home ports all the way down here to the Caribbean if they weren't going to be able to catch as many whales as they used to. So they stopped, or more appropriately, I should say, they moved on. They moved on to other parts of the world that still had a lot of whales. Think of Antarctica, cold, inhospitable, but full of whales. This is when Antarctic or Southern Ocean whaling really started to take off. Those men, like old Bill Wallace, who had learned the skills of the whaler, were dropped off back on their home islands, Bill and Beckway, others on other islands, without very much to show for their experience. He had obtained a wife and started a family. Many other men who were in his same position had not done so well with their whaling experience. But every one of them did have one thing that they could bring back home, knowledge. The skills of the whaler had been transmitted to these local men who were now dropped off on their home islands without employment from the American whale ships. So what did they do? What would you do? They started whaling locally. Old Bill Wallace, started the first Caribbean whaling station on Beckway in the, in the late 1800s, in the 1880s. The idea of local-based whaling soon began to spread, first throughout the Grenadines, as this map shows, and then later throughout the Southern Caribbean more generally. At the end, or I should say at the peak, of locally driven Caribbean whaling, at least 11 Caribbean islands hosted locally run, that is Caribbean run, whaling stations. The income went into Caribbean pockets. The revenues built Caribbean houses and Caribbean ships. 
This was a local industry that had been imported through the transfer of knowledge from the American whalers. What you see today when you go to Barrelly or you go to Paget Farm is the direct, the direct offspring of this original Caribbean whaling. Is it indigenous? No. It does not trace itself back to the Carib or Arawak inhabitants of this part of the world. Is it traditional? Absolutely. A whaling boat in Barrelly looks almost identical to a whaling boat from Beckway from 100 years ago. There are some changes. There's an outboard motor on the back and a harpoon gun on the front. But the design of the boat, the boat craft, is the same as it used to be. Even some of the targets are the same. In Beckway, as you know, the humpback whale is the only target, the only species that is hunted by Beckwayan whalers. On the main island of St. Vincent in, in Verily, the blackfish, the pilot whale, is still the main target. But many other species are taken as well. I give you just a, a small cast of characters here. These are some of the species that are taken. Now, if you're from Barrelly, as many of our guests today are, you've probably seen these animals, probably not alive, but hauled up onto shore after recently being taken by the whaling boats. If you're not from Barrelly, your experience with these animals might be a little bit more removed. You might have seen them only after they had been processed into crips or meat or bottles of oil. I'm going to go through a little bit here of the process by which we go from live animals to products, to commodities, just so that you can see the process that's happening. I, as, as Louise mentioned, I, I've been working here in St. Vincent for many years. About 10 years ago, I conducted a survey with some post-secondary students, mostly here in Kingstown. And I asked, have you ever seen the entire animal? I know you've seen the blackfish, I know you've seen crips and bottle of oil, but have you seen the entire animal? And the majority of my respondents said no. I wasn't talking to students from Barrelly at this time. Had I asked that question there, of course I would have gotten a different answer. But from Kingstown, they hadn't seen it. So I want to go through the process of what happens. And I understand, if you're already familiar with this, this is going to be knowledge you already have. I hope you'll bear with me, though, as we show to other people what the process is like. I've made sure that none of the pictures are too graphic or too gory. Obviously, killing an animal and turning it into food is a graphic, gory process. I, I, my purpose is not to shock you, so I'm not going to include the butchering pictures, except where it is necessary to illustrate the process. So the whale boat leaves port. I'll speak first about Barrelly and then Beckway afterwards. During the most intense part of my research, I was working on board one of these whale boats. I was mostly going out on Samuel Hazelwood's boat, the Sea Hunter. I filled the position of the center man, the middle position here. I wasn't driving the boat, I wasn't firing the harpoon. I was standing in the middle, mostly passing things back and forth from one person to the other. I was there to help. For three months, I went out six days a week whaling. You're too young to remember, but some of your parents might have seen me walking back up to the bus stop from the pier in Barrelly, usually with salt water and whale blood on my clothes, getting ready to catch a ride back to the apartment I was staying in. I, I did this daily for three months. I wanted to experience what it was like. I did not want to be an interloper, somebody who comes in and speaks about something that he hasn't seen himself. So I did it. Here's what I see. Here's what I saw. We'd be out offshore, and there would be a dorsal fin breaking the surface. In this case, it's a Rissos dolphin. It was quite often spinner dolphins or pilot whales. I never saw a killer whale harpooned, but I've seen pictures just be a much larger dorsal fin. When the gun was lined up and the boats bobbing and the dolphins breaching or the whales breaching were all lined up together, the harpooner would squeeze the trigger. Or if the dolphin or whale was close enough to the boat, he would throw the harpoon with his hand. When you throw a harpoon, you've got better control over where it goes and you also don't have the expense of the shotgun shell that propels it from the gun. If you need it to go farther, you fire it from the gun. The animal would be dragged up alongside the boat a harpoon is not an instrument of death. A harpoon is an instrument of attachment. The harpoon merely attaches the animal to the boat by the line that is connected to the harpoon. Sometimes the animal would die, more often it would not. If it was small enough, we would haul the animal up into the boat. If it was larger, like a blackfish or a killer whale, we would tie it alongside to drag it from the gunnels. 
remember, the animal was often alive. And there I was in the center, which is the position closest to where the animals go, helping to haul this animal in. As they would pile up throughout the course of a successful day of whaling, I would have sometimes five, six, I think the most I ever saw was 12 dolphins or small whales piled up at my feet in various stages of dying. It was a very in-your-face process for me. The animals are hauled ashore when the boat returns at the end of the day and are processed into food. This is starting to begin the part that you might be more familiar with. You go down to Barely the day after a successful whaling voyage has taken place, you see these racks set up on the beach, meat drying in the sun. If your timing is just right, you'll see cubes of blubber. This is the fat layer on the outside of the whale or dolphin that keeps it warm during its deep dives, being chopped up and cooked into crips. The finished crips are in the back. That's probably most familiar to those of you that are from Kingstown or other parts of the country. And then, of course, the final food product. You've got your dried blackfish meat in my hand on the left. You've got your crips, in this case, in their own oil, often obviously separated on the right. In Beckway, it's a little bit different. There is still the use of sailboats. The harpoons are still thrown by hand. The degree to which sailboats are used exclusively, of course, is debatable and has been shown to change with the times. Humpback whales are much larger. The boat approaches the whale with no chance of pulling it inside. The goal is to get the whale fast on the harpoon line so that it can then be dragged into shore. Quite often, the dragging goes the opposite way. Quite often, the whale drags the boat. It was said during the heyday of American whaling that you could go for what was called a Nantucket sleigh ride. This was when you're in a boat being dragged by a whale that is much stronger than your rowing is able to propel you. They're not whaling anymore out of Nantucket, haven't been doing so for decades, maybe over a century. I would propose that this ought to be called a Beckway sleigh ride. When the whale is finally dead or tired out, it is dragged into Simple K, where it's butchered and processed for food. Many of you that have been down to Beckway after a whale was taken have seen something that looks like this. First, specialists, people that are engaged in whaling directly, are butchering and removing the saleable parts of the meat and the blubber. Humpback whales have much thicker blubber. You can make much more uh, crips or crip-like food with humpback whale than blackfish. The meat can be cooked in a variety of ways. I've had it probably every way that it can be made, even the tempura style that the old Japanese aid worker used to make down at Baga Fish Fest. Thank you very much. That was my favorite way. Is it nice? <laughs> it's popular. Not only is the food product popular, but whaling is popular as well. Now, this is my estimate for the number of whales and dolphins taken by the Barely operation the one here in St. Vincent, uh, going back about 60 years. There are some periods of time for which I have no data. The periods of time for which I do have data are estimates. There's no central repository of statistics for whaling, at least not that I'm aware of and that I have access to. So what I've done is reconstructed the catch based on what I do know and what I can assume has taken place when I wasn't on hand to see what was happening. You see that there have been periods of plenty and periods of not very much. You see there are some times where whaling declined rather steeply over the course of just a few years. One of those is right here. In 1972, the United States passed what it called the Marine Mammal Protection Act. One of the things that this law did was forbid the import of whale oil or any other whale product into the United States. Prior to this, a lot of the whale oil that was created in Barely, that was, that was boiled out of the blubber in Barely, was packaged and sent to the United States, mostly for mechanical lubrication. Uh, if you have an old pocket watch, and I mean old, 50 years old or older, the lubrication of the gears inside the watch might be done through whale oil. If you have an even older lamp or candle that, that burns to produce light, 100 years, 200 years old, that might have been designed to burn whale oil. 
this was a product that was almost like petroleum is today. It had universal application and was used around the world. When whale oil was no longer able to be imported into the United States, which was one of the major markets for Vincentian whaling, it looked as though whaling was going to stop. In fact, there have been threats that have cropped up over the years, many times in lots of diverse ways, that have shown themselves to be possible reasons for whaling in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to stop. One of the lessons I've learned in working here for more than a decade is that Vincentians are resilient people. And I don't, I don't like to paint with a broad brush. Obviously not every Vincentian is resilient. But as a culture, one thing I've learned from you is that you do not crumble in the face of a threat. When something happens that would otherwise throw an industry or a business into its decline, Vincentians have shown themselves time and time again to find ways around that. How did they find their way around? How did you find your way around the ban on importing whale oil to the United States? Eating the food products became more and more popular. Prior to this time, yes, people ate whale meat, people ate crips. It became even more popular after this, and you see that it resurged. It resurged for a few years, but then started to decline again. In the 1980s, the late 70s and the early 1980s, it looked as though whaling was going to stop. This time it was a different reason. Not because any laws were passed, but simply because people had caught too many whales. This is again focusing on the barely operation. This is not humpbacks in Beckway, this is barely. And they were whaling too much. This chart shows the relative percentage of blackfish in blue to all other species in red. And I want you to just look at three trends during these three time periods here, conveniently separated by periods for which I have no data. Over the years, as blackfish became more scarce, whalers in Barely started focusing their efforts more and more on different species. We collectively call them papas. Each one has its own species designation scientifically, of course. The result, though, was that the pressure on the blackfish was reduced. The populations were given time and space to uh, replace themselves. Yes, blackfish continued to be hunted, but not at 57%. In the more recent years, it's been closer to 30%. That relief of pressure, that redirection of pressure onto other species allowed blackfish time to recover. In Beckway, whaling has been a lot more regular, a lot more regulated. Because humpback whales are protected internationally by the International Whaling Commission, Beckway is, well, St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a whole, is not allowed to take more than four per year. That limit has been revised over the years. I remember when it used to be two, it increased to four, but it's still a hard limit. Taking more than four right now, this year, would be a violation of that policy. There is no such limit on whaling in Barrowley. Because of that, the natural ebb and flow of effort versus catch versus value, the economics of supply and demand regulate whaling much more efficiently there much more effectively there than it does in Beckway. <coughs> there have been human threats as well to the continuation of whaling here. For a long time, people from outside St. Vincent and the Grenadines have learned of whaling, discovered, as people from other parts of the world like to say, that there was whaling happening here, and have wanted it to stop. And they've used the tools they had available to make it stop. Sometimes tourism boycotts have been threatened. Sometimes bloody exposés have been published in regional and international news sources. Sometimes the appeal to side with admired foreign politicians in their fight to protect whales has been made. Obama wants to save whales, don't you as well? Right? Identifying one identifying a person whom is normally appreciated and admired, and then connecting what they do in terms of conservation. It's very effective. It's very effective except, for, except when it's not. Because despite these campaigns, whaling has continued. And the records that I have show no correlation between the numbers of whales taken per year and the existence or non-existence of any of these campaigns. 
Some are more recent. Dr. Sylvia Earle is probably the most famous oceanographer in the world. She has a series of what are called hope spots all over the globe. You can get a world map and she's got pins everywhere. These are called hope spots because she hopes that something can change in each of these places. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a hope spot. She hopes that whaling can stop here. That's why this is a hope spot. And sometimes the tide of international public attention turns against St. Vincent and the Grenadines. A couple of years ago, in 2017, when some orca, some pilot whales, excuse me, some killer whales were harpooned uh, within sight, perhaps at the same time that they were being watched by a group of whale watching tourists, this caused international outcry. National Geographic picked up the story. They didn't run this photo, but they ran photos similar to this that showed the whales being pursued in front of a boat full of tourists. It was a very difficult time in terms of international relations between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the rest of the world. Prime Minister Gonsalves talked about the possibility of banning the hunt for killer whales at this time. That ban hasn't come in. He, 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 he promised that he would. He promised that he would ban the hunting of killer whales. And to my knowledge, with my last conversation at the fisheries ministry, uh, that has not come into play yet. There is also some local opposition as well. I do not mean to paint the picture of an us versus them kind of scenario. When I talk about these things abroad, I'm especially careful not to portray St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a uniform, monolithic opinion about anything. Who's, who's the best Soka performer? You're not going to agree. Should whaling continue? Vincentians are not going to agree. It's never going to be 100%. There is local opposition as well. The SDG Environmental Fund has, as Ms. Mitchell has mentioned before, funded the development of whale watching opportunities here, specifically as an alternative to whaling. Salvage Blue, my friend Adam Gravel's organization, is actively pursuing change in Barely not to whale watching in this case, but to other forms of food production that will replace whaling as both a food source and an economic initiative. And even this very organization that is hosting us today, the National Trust of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, is actively working to save the humpback whales that swim around Barely, or around Beckway, precisely by reducing the threat of whaling to those whales. St. Vincent and the Grenadine, like every other country in the world, is a complex place made up of real people, each of whom has their own opinion, each of whom has their own values and beliefs. But the tide of change in the population has not yet come, even in, in, in the face of these oppositions to whaling from people abroad and, to a degree, from people within the country. I did surveys in 2018, it's been about a year and a half now. Some of you might have seen mostly my students traveling around the country. Some of you might have been interviewed by my students. We interviewed about a thousand people in the country, asking lots of questions about the diet, not just about whales, about fish, fruit, processed foods, all kinds of things. But this one piece of data really stood out to me. If you look at consumption of both the small whales and dolphins, the papuses from Barely, and the humpback whales from Beckway, about 75% of Vincentians regularly consume the foods from these animals. That's a majority. That's a strong majority. That's most of the people in this country. Now, of course, it's nuanced, both demographically and geographically, right? The, the, the consumption is not uniform across the country. Whether you're looking at divisions among the population by gender, by age, by socioeconomic level, by religion, there are differences in consumption rates. As you would expect, those who are in Beckway or closer to Beckway have more access to the humpback whale food products. Those in Barrelly have more access to the blackfish food products. Interestingly, though, over on the windward side in the country, there's some very um, dedicated consumers of blackfish. They rely on these networks of transportation the vendors who get into their vehicles or get onto the vans and ride around the country selling their products. They're the ones 
that are creating this network, this geographical network here, even down through the Grenadines. I've seen women on the ferry, even after the fast ferry left. I've seen women on the slow ferry with bundles of blackfish going down to the southern Grenadines to sell. Vincentians are resilient. The Vincentian whaling tradition is resilient. Whaling has continued in spite of these threats that have come from international legal changes, declining populations of the animals that are swimming free in the ocean, human opposition both from abroad and from within. But there's a new threat today that I want to tell you about. And I'm not bold enough to say that this threat is insur insurmountable. I've seen people at their very best, at their most resilient. I do know, however, the science behind this next threat. And I know that it's going to be a major challenge. To understand the threat, we're going to take a short trip to the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands is another island country. It's in the far North Atlantic. You can see it circled here between Iceland and Norway. Very cold, uh, very different climate to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but a place where a similar hunt for whales occurs. They even hunt similar species. In the Faroe Islands, the main target is the long-finned pilot whale. That's another blackfish. It's a cousin species to the short-finned pilot whale here, and a couple of other dolphin species as well. The way they hunt is very different. You may have seen pictures of this online. If you've read through my book, you've seen some pictures there as well. The whales will be herded together like sheep and chased by a multitude of boats up onto the beach. They're caused to beach themselves. You've heard of whales and dolphins accidentally beaching themselves. This is human-induced beaching. When they're driven up onto the beach, then they're killed with knives. People use their hand tools to kill these animals. This was a popular form of food production in the Faroe Islands. It still is to some degree, despite some challenges. The history of whaling there goes back at least 500 years. We have records of the number of whales and caught back to the 1500s. Legends go back even 1,000 years that it was still happening before that. This is a major part of their culture and heritage. The Faroe Islands hosted a jazz festival. The icon for this jazz festival was a pilot whale playing a saxophone. That's how intrinsic this, this food production method is to their culture. It was a popular food product, at least as popular as it is here in St. Vincent. Until recently. In the 1970s and 80s, Faroese public health scientists began to notice that there, was, there were high levels of pollutants in the food produced through whaling. I'm going to focus here on mercury. HG is the um, scientific term for mercury. But that's just representative of an entire suite of contaminants that they started to find. In 1978, the average level of mercury in Faroese whales was about one and a half parts per million. Let that unit sink in. Parts per million. You've got a million of something, and one part, one and a half parts, is mercury. That's how potent this contaminant is. It's dangerous enough that one part in a million can be harmful to you. At the time, in the 1970s, the Danish standard, I should clarify that the Faroe Islands are a colony of Denmark, just like St. Vincent and the Grenadines used to be a colony of the UK. Uh, they haven't broken free yet. They're still under that colonial relationship. The Danish standard for the maximum amount of mercury that you should take in was half a part per million, or one part per two million, you could say. So the average level they detected in the 1970s was three times what the limit should have been. They started issuing, the public health officials started issuing dietary recommendations. They started saying, don't eat so much. Maybe space it out once a week. Maybe once every two weeks. They kept doing studies, taking new samples, finding higher and higher contaminant levels, reducing the amount or the frequency by which people could eat safely. It started off being once a week, then it was once every two weeks. Then it was once a month, and if you're pregnant, you shouldn't have it at all. Then it was once every two months, and if you're female, you shouldn't have it at all. It was getting stricter and stricter and stricter until 2008, when the Faroese public health officials made the remarkable statement that pilot whale meat should no longer be considered safe for human consumption, full stop. Think about this. Their history of whaling is at least 10 times as long as the whaling history here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's just as popular a food product as it is here. And yet, their official government health authorities were telling them, this isn't safe for human consumption anymore. 
people didn't stop eating. People reduced their consumption, but they didn't stop eating. So the public health officials continued taking samples and continued doing analysis. Over the years, they saw an increase in the concentration of mercury. It was one and a half parts per million back in the 1970s. It's right about two parts per million right now. Interestingly and somewhat tellingly, the threshold, the, the limit, has increased as well. I guess when, when the environment becomes so polluted that your food source is permanently tainted, you just raise your threshold about what becomes acceptable. So now that the World Health Organization has made a statement about their recommendation, there's a bit more. It's one part per million rather than 0.5. But you can see that the average still exceeds what the World Health Organization recommends. Importantly, that WHO recommendation is for the entire world. This isn't anything specific to the Faroe Islands. Their physiology is just the same as ours. Any person who ingests mercury is going to be damaged by that mercury. So I started going through the literature to find what the mercury levels here in St. Vincent were. And I found next to nothing. There was one study done from St. Lucia back in the 1970s that showed high levels. Nothing had ever been done here. So I shifted my research and started collecting samples. When I would go out whaling, I would carry a small knife with me and take little cubic centimeter sized pieces of muscle and blubber and liver and kidney. I went through the process of getting the paperwork to import them back into the United States and I ran them through the laboratory. Did the statistics, canceled out the outliers, looked at the middle, looked at the, the average to see what we had. And here's what we found. The average concentration of mercury in Vincentian caught blackfish is more than 10 times what we're currently finding now in the Faroe Islands. And in the Faroe Islands, before it even got to this point, the government told them to stop eating. I said Vincentians are resilient people, and I believe that. I've been coming to this country for more than 12 years now, and I see no reason to ever stop. I love this place, and I love the people that I've gotten to know here. And even though I can't see a way to overcome these numbers, I'm not the one whose job that is. This is the job of Vincentian people. This is the challenge that you're faced with. What are we going to do about it? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue the research. You're going to see my face and the faces of my students a lot more over the next few years. I'm going to be here going from community to community, learning about people's diets, taking samples of people's hair if they'll give it, so I can me measure not just the mercury in the food, but the mercury in the people as well. I'm going to continue working in the laboratory. This is a, a, a device that dries pilot whale meat. It essentially replicates the barrelly sunshine in my lab back in the United States. Dries the meat so that we can put it in through the analysis and, and, and look for other contaminants. Mercury is just the tip of the iceberg. There are other metals. There are pesticides and industrial pollutants. There are microplastics. Every time you, you, you throw a plastic straw into the trash can, if it doesn't go to the landfill and it winds up in the ocean, it breaks into microscopic pieces. We're finding those pieces in the tissues. And I'm going to look at the broad scale as well. Why is it that at one end of the North Atlantic Ocean, we've got slightly high levels of mercury, high enough to recommend that, they, that the food not be consumed, but at the other end, we've got 10 times as much. Is it the Caribbean volcanoes producing that mercury? Maybe. Is it something about the ocean currents that are carrying that pollution from other parts of the world here? Maybe. Is it related to atmospheric currents or the major rivers of North and South America dumping the pollution here? Maybe. I know what it's not, though. It's not Vincentian pollution. The, the products we're finding in these tissues taken from the whales caught in Barley were not put there from any industry that exists in St. Vincent. These are foreign pollutants. They're being forced upon your food system from outside. There's an element of injustice there that I hope is recognized. The title of my talk included the word future, but I'm not going to be so bold as to tell you what the future of Eastern Caribbean whaling is. I will just say that there is a formidable challenge happening right now. I will also tell you that I've stopped eating blackfish. I used to eat it when I came here. After getting those numbers, I stopped. I don't let my students eat it anymore either when they come. I know some people locally here that have stopped eating it for the same reason. 
it may be the case that that is the best way forward. It may be the case that some resilient Vincentian thinks of something that I haven't even thought of before. But either way, things are about to change, and I hope that you'll be here with me to see that change through, to make sure that it is sustainable, to make sure that it is equitable, and to make sure that it is just. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Oh, no. So at this time, I know that he has said a lot that has grown, and I believe that a number of us will have concerns. So we are into the phase, so we will take the questions now. The name of the school of Open Central is great, Paul. Thank you. The process is a pretty interesting presentation. I've learned a lot about wearing. <laughs> a lot of it there for um, quite a number of years. But my question has to do with um, the last point that you were making with the military level that I found, especially the local um, blackfish. Um, if you could just clear up for people like myself who are not familiar with the type of species, what exactly would you prepare to Oh, good, good question. Yeah, um, he asked what the blackfish are eating so that they get so much mercury. And, and that shows me that you understand the process, right? Mercury is deposited through, mostly through water, right? So think of when rain falls on the ocean, when rivers empty into the ocean from, from land. This brings mercury uh, into the environment. It comes from other ways too, but that's the main ways that human-created mercury gets deposited in the environment. Mercury is very heavy. It's a metal. It's a liquid metal, but it's still a heavy metal. It sinks to the bottom of the ocean where tiny bacteria ingest it. Okay, the microscopic organisms that you can't see with your naked eye. These bacteria ingest the mercury. Incidentally, they also change its state from pure mercury to what's called methylated mercury, which happens to be a more, a more dangerous kind for humans. These tiny bacteria then are consumed by slightly larger animals. Those animals are consumed by something larger, the classic food chain, right? And it goes all the way up to blackfish and other large animals in the ocean. We as humans then, when we consume those animals, we take their position at the top of the food chain. So you're the apex predator every time you eat meat. You're the one at the top of the food chain. It's always safer to eat lower on the food chain. Vegetarians, across the board have a safer diet when it comes to contaminant exposure than meat eaters. Those who do eat meat, but choose to eat meat low on the food chain, that is smaller fish, herbivore animals, as opposed to carnivores, they're safer as well. Those of us who eat blackfish, which is a predatory carnivore species, we're putting ourselves at the top of a very long food chain. So to answer your question most directly, the blackfish are eating large fish and squid, that's where they're getting it directly from. But each of those species has eaten an entire food chain of smaller and smaller animals underneath. Yeah, you have yes, please. Parts per million. Parts per million of mercury. What's yeah. the implication for bin sections? Or anybody for the matter, for, for that matter, to eat that high amount of um, mercury? So, great, great question. And I can speak generally. So, yes. I am, I'm not a physician. I have never done that sort of training, and I'm not qualified to um, do any sort of health care for people. There are lots of local people here that are qualified for this, and they've probably seen some of the symptoms. Mercury is a neurotoxin. 
What that means is it's, it's toxic to your neurologic system, your brain and your nerves. Children that are exposed to mercury in small doses for a long period of time, in other words, for their entire childhood, perform less well on standardized tests, for example, than children that were not exposed to mercury. If you eat mercury, you don't, if you eat food containing mercury, you're not going to feel sick. And this is one of the problems with mercury. It slips in unnoticed. You, you don't get a stomach ache. You don't get a migraine from consuming it. Instead, your life is altered from what it would have been otherwise. If you eat it once, probably no harm. If you eat it weekly for your entire life, you're probably going to be worse off than you would have been otherwise. But how do you know? You can't live your life twice, once with blackfish and once without. But unfortunately, that's the comparison that you need to make to understand the effects of this kind of mercury toxicity. It's not something that's going to kill you. Yes, mercury can kill you, but in high acute doses. This low dose, long-term exposure results in something that's much more difficult to diagnose. But it's something that affects people's lives profoundly. If your neurological development, by the time you reach adulthood, was not everything that it could have been, that's a problem for your quality of life. That's a problem for nearly every other aspect of your life. Right? The problem is you don't get to live your life twice to make that comparison. The poet Robert Frost said that when he was presented with a choice of which path to take, he took the road less traveled. And at the end of that poem, he said, and that has made all the difference. With all due respect to Robert Frost, he didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't take both paths. He took the one that he took, and that was his life. Unless you live your life twice, changing one variable, you'll never see the change. All you can do is rely upon the science, the health studies that have shown when you take one cohort of young people who are exposed and another cohort that is not, you get measurable differences in the intellectual development of both of those groups. Does that mean that you yourself are going to be affected at a certain degree? It's impossible to say. This is more of a population issue than an individual issue. Yeah, yeah. So the oil is produced from the blubber, right? The, the blubber is boiled down and it, it gives off its oil. The meat has more mercury in it than the, than the blubber. So, and I, I don't mean to make this as a recommendation, but if you had to choose between meat and blubber, blubber or oil, and the only thing you cared about was mercury exposure, you're safer with the blubber and the oil. But there are other contaminants that are found in higher concentrations in the blubber than in the meat. So it's a gamble, you know, and, and it's, it's choosing your poison quite literally. <laughs> Did I say I'm on the last slide? Good morning, I'm Dr. Murray from the University of Let me commend you for your presentation. I didn't get to see the full presentation, but I think it's the last piece. simply yes, it is safe to say that other fish species are contaminated as well. It's important to note though that mercury concentrations increase as you move up the food chain. 
So species that are higher on the food chain are expected to have more mercury than species who are lower on the food chain. So if you're eating jackfish and sprat, you're better off in terms of mercury exposure. There may be other problems that I am not even addressing here, but just narrowly focusing on mercury exposure, you are better off eating something smaller that's lower on the food chain than you are eating something larger and higher on the food chain. There are other considerations as well. I don't know if I have any Buddhists in the audience, but a Buddhist recognizes the value of every life. If a person eats from a whale, or from a blackfish, they're sharing that food from that one life with their entire community. A blackfish is a large animal that can feed many people. A sprat is so small that you normally eat, you have to eat so many of them for one meal. So you're taking multiple lives when you eat a fish patty, a fish cake, as compared to one life feeding many people when you eat a whale. How does that compare to your concerns for your health? It depends. These are human questions. Some people value their spirituality and the desire to cause as little harm as possible through the taking of lives. Others value their own health and the health of their families more than that. These are individual decisions. I talk regularly with ministers or with the uh, staff at the ministries, both the fisheries and health, and I never advocate for a ban on whaling. I advocate for information for the public. I, I feel that this is the sort of thing that should not be legislated that instead should be left up to the individual to make an individual prudent decision based on the values that that individual holds in other parts of the world, somewhere I've worked, and I've seen how that affects local culture and local economy. I think that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is in a good position, having seen this kind of thing play out in so many other countries, we have lessons here that we can learn from. As we navigate this challenge, we can do it in an informed way because other countries have dealt with it first before us. The challenge, though, is to learn from others, something that's often hard for us to do. I didn't say the year. It was the 1970s. I want to say right around 77. They were, they were higher than, so he's asking about the study of whales, mercury in whales in St. Lucia. Um, so a few caveats. First, this was a study that was done more than 40 years ago. They only looked at, I think, something like seven individual whales. So not a very big sample size. I've got more than 200 in my sample size. So the data they produced were not as reliable as what I'm showing you here. They found an average concentration, I want to say it was on the order of three parts per million. So much lower than what I'm finding. So some things have changed, right? The world has become more industrialized. Uh, there are a lot more people in the world burning coal and mining for gold and doing these other things that produce mercury in the environment. Also, the science is getting better. My detection methods have the advantage of 40 years of refinement since the previous person did his work. I trust my data. And let me, let me, open, let me open the box completely and show you the, the 20.5 parts per million that's a specific measurement. That is pilot whales, blackfish, and that is the muscle, the meat. It's not referring to the internal organs like kidneys and liver, which are sky high on mercury and should never be eaten. It's not referring to blubber, which is much lower on mercury. It's not referring to killer whales or spotted dolphins or these other species that often get thrown into the mix. I don't know if you're aware of this, but when you buy blackfish at the market, only some of the time are you getting blackfish, pilot whale. Quite often, you're getting other species of, of pappas, maybe killer whale, maybe spotted dolphin. You're, you're getting a mix. We separated them out by species and looked at the levels within each species. Because there can be some very specific changes made to the local whaling operation here that would reduce the average mercury level. If you want to bring it down, an easy way is to stop hunting killer whales, the, the whitefish, the orca. Those, that, that's a species that has much more mercury than the others. Because it's so much higher on the food chain, if it were to be removed from the mix, that average would come down. Okay, I have not thought from my young people. Just if anyone is don't be shy. If you're not comfortable asking in public, you can sit in your teacher. I believe you would be able to represent you well. Other than that, you can ask them 
I'm also happy to receive messages by email. I left this up here specifically for anybody who might have a question after the fact. Yes. You asked about sickness in, in people, correct? Um, yes, so as I, as I mentioned, it's, mercury is a neurotoxin which affects someone's development over their entire lifetime. There are other contaminants that we're finding that act a lot more quickly. Um, some of the most important ones are a group of contaminants called persistent organic pollutants. They go by the acronym POPs. So there are POPs that we're finding. These are mostly the product of various industries. So if you have ever cooked, if you've ever uh, scrambled eggs on a pan that has that non-stick coating so that you can wash it easily, the stuff that makes that non-stick coating is a pollutant. And when it enters the ocean environment, it is persistent. That's what the P stands for. It doesn't disintegrate. It stays forever. That works its way up the food chain the same way as mercury and gets into the tissues of whales and fish and other organisms. When you consume that, it has a very different effect on you than mercury. The the biggest problem with persistent organic pollutants is not for the person who consumes them, it's for the children of that person. If you consume them, and this is specifically talk, speaking of females, if, if a woman or a young girl consumes too much persistent organic pollutant, she can pass it on to her babies, even if her babies have not yet been conceived. It stays in your body and you can pass it along. So there are other contaminants that have these kind of acute effects where mercury is more of a, it's more of a hidden danger because it affects you over the long term. We have another student that can ask a question. Yeah. For the kids, for the, the students' interest, if you want to look up about um, mercury poisoning from food, you can search for Minamata disease. Hmm. There was a big thing in Japan a few years back and in China. And, and Mr. Reed's example is a very good one. That was a case where there was a factory that was using mercury or producing mercury, and they had a spill. It was an industrial chemical spill that dumped mercury into the bay, and then people would fish in the bay and eat the fish. So it was, it was a much more high dose, acute exposure than what we're talking about here with the blackfish. But if you want to look at the extreme end of what mercury poisoning can do, his, his example is a very good one. Um, it can be a bit frightening to look at the effects of people who had Minamata disease, um, but it gives you sort of a perspective on a worst case scenario. It's a, it's a great question and it's something that I, I wrestle with all the time. And let me first say that I am not here to tell you that whaling needs to stop. I know that plenty of other people in the room will tell you that very statement, but that is not my position. My position is that there is a very big risk to the continuation of whaling and I would tread very carefully if I were involved. Um, and, and on this point, I differ from many people with whom I work quite often, but that, that is my personal position, that this is a challenge, this is not necessarily a requirement that it stop. But it might stop, right? I mean, people might start to reduce their consumption. People might choose to give up consumption altogether. And basic economics tells you without demand, there should be no supply. There will be no supply. There's no reason for supply without demand, right? So it may be the case that whaling comes to an end here, and it may happen rather quickly. I don't know. If that happens, you're absolutely right that an important sector of the food production system here will have gone missing. How will that be replaced? Could it be with more fishing? Could it be with more agriculture, more use of the land, both for livestock and for plant-based food products? Could it be more imports, more cheap chicken wings from Miami? It could be any of these things, right? You, there could be a Bickles on every corner. I, there are many different ways to replace food that goes missing from a food system, some of those ways are more healthy than others. And I would hope that 
those who make the decisions, and by the way, that's you, because every one of you eats local food here from St. Vincent. You vote by your choices. I would hope that those of you who make the decisions as to what you will eat will do so in a thoughtful way. What do you want to see more of? Whatever food products you want, whatever food products you demand, are the food products that will be supplied. Right? So the way that we eat, it's, it's, it's been said by an American writer named Wendell Berry that the act of eating is a political act. And I think that's true. When you choose what your next meal is going to be made of, you are voting with your dollars. You are voting with your belly. You're voting by what you choose to put onto your plate. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good point on which you remind everybody that these books are for sale. And that is dollars? Yeah. I just want to urge you to at least get your personal copy, particularly um, those of us who are teaching, so we can share the information with our students, our, our staff members. I just want to remind you that we don't want to be here with all of these still stacked on this table. I expect you to see the checkbooks coming up as well. I, at this point, I believe I can Thank you. Thank you. It is also on the road. Everything you need to know is not always found in a book. And when you have such rich information being shared, we really need to show our appreciation for your deliberate effort. Because you could have chosen to go somewhere else, but you chose to come to us and to speak to our children and to the rest of those of us who are Well, let, let me just tell you that the, the past decade or more of doing work here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been such a pleasure to me. There have been challenges, right? I mean, I chose the wrong van sometimes to get out to Barley and had to hang on for my life. <laughs> but, but the welcome that I've received from these communities here in this country has been like none that I've received anywhere else. So I, I thank you for making this foreign researcher feel welcome here in this place. I born in Paget Farm, Beckway. My great grandfather, he was a whaler, that whale on the Yankee whaling ship. My grandfather also whale on the Yankee whaling ship. Then my father, he was a whaler. So I always tell myself, when I grow up, I want to be a whaler also. I met Eustace some 20 years ago on the tiny island of Bekwe in the Southeast Caribbean. He was a teenager hoping to realize his childhood ambition and find a position on the whaling crew with this man, Chief Harpooner, at Neil Alibert. When I harpoon a whale, from the time I harpoon a whale, I turn like a lion. I don't want nobody to talk to me. I mean that as a fighter, the whale can kill me any time, so I don't study whether I have to die or not. I mean I must kill the whale. And I, I t telling them to do this in the boat and do that, and all the time I want to be, have the boat right up to the whale. And I feel that nobody mustn't tell me nothing, don't tell me I can't do this, don't tell me I can't do that. I mean it, it a harpoon and I must kill it. 
Whaling here started in the mid-1800s when the Yankee whalers enlisted and trained the talented seamen of Beckway. One of them bought two boats from the Yankee whalers and started a fishery here in Friendship Bay. To the consternation of many, Atneal and Eustace, along with a dozen or so other resolute men, plied the 19th century trade of their forefathers into the 21st century. In the last 25 years, the Beckley whalers have landed on average one humpback whale per year. To the delight of the whalers' families and friends hungry for sustenance, the drama of the chase at sea unfolds right in front of them. struggling to maintain a unique identity, hear their neighbors cheering them on. The whalers maintain a deep reverence for nature, as well as a direct connection to their survival, a connection that we, in the modern world, sometimes forget.